If you don't get this thing with Jesus right, it doesn't matter how well you do in your finances, how well you do in your emotional life, how well you do relationally, for He is in fact everything. Whatever is not from God will ultimately either run out or run you down at some point. I need you to know today, it still works to trust Jesus. In a world that is trying to find a new way to do the old thing, it has worked, it does work, and it forever will work to do things God's way. John chapter two is where we're gonna be uh, focusing our time today. Uh, this is a wedding at Cana. This is in fact the first miracle that Jesus will perform in his earthly ministry. And we're gonna begin reading in verse one. The Bible says this, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they had run out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of the purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons a piece. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and he did not know where it had come from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. But when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. But you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. The title of the message today is this, Lessons from a Wedding. Lessons from a Wedding. Let's pray and believe that the Holy Spirit is gonna to speak to us. God, I thank you so much for your presence. We acknowledge that you are in fact in the room and God, we say that whatever you want, we want. Whatever your desire is, is our desire in this moment right now. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak directly to each and every one of our hearts and our souls. God, that no matter what is heard, God, I pray that your voice would be heard most clearly and most specifically. God, you know it, what it is that we need. You know what we're struggling with. You know what is at the top of our mind right now. God, I pray that you would break through any wall that we have set up, and God, that you would speak directly to us, for our heart is to hear from you. We long to be like you, and God, our prayer is that because of these moments that we share, we would be more like you when we leave than ever before. No matter what our reason for being here today is, God, we acknowledge that you had a reason for us to be here. So we say our hearts are open, our minds are open. Speak to us in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said, Amen. 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 Um, one, one of the most special parts about being a parent, being a father, being a mother, is, is the firsts that you get to be a part of with your kids. If you're, a, if you're a parent in the room, you know this to be true. Getting to celebrate the firsts is, is some of the most special moments that you share and you document them. And, and this, is, this is very much true of my wife and I and where we're at in our life right now. There are so many firsts that are happening, first words. Uh, first riding a bike, first this, first that, first talking back. You learn that they could do that. That is awesome as well. Um, but, but you document all of these things, right? And I'm so thankful my wife is much better at this than I am, but she's got a list in her phone of all the first words and the first time they said this and the first time they put their shoes on and the first time that they tied their shoes and the first time that they knew how to open up your phone and just do stuff on it and you didn't know that they knew how to do that, right? We even document the first time they hit certain, certain heights, right? For all the parents in the room, you know that one of the most primary firsts that you're looking forward to is when they hit that first height where they can go on like all the rides at Disneyland and you can actually like get the most out of your money when you go there, you know? These firsts matter. But I wanna help you understand today and, and part of my, my assignment today is to help you understand that firsts, though they're important to us, uh, it's not a human concept. It's not something that we made up. Firsts are important to God. And you see it actually out throughout all of scripture that firsts matter to God. In fact, there's something uh, called the law of first mention even. 
that we find that the first time a word is mentioned, the first time that a person is mentioned or, or maybe uh, a, a certain phrase is used, that it establishes a precedent or a pattern, maybe even a biblical concept that we can then see throughout the rest of scripture. Okay, and here in John chapter two, this is the first miracle that Jesus performs. Up until this point, he has not, he has not ha um, uh, had any sort of sign that would point to him being the one that, that everybody has been longing for. He has not necessarily done anything. Like he, This is the first miracle that he has done. And so it's important for us to know that if firsts matter to God, first, if firsts matter to me, and if firsts matter to God more importantly, then why this miracle first? What is it about this miracle? What is it about this that the Holy Spirit obviously inspired John to make sure that this was first? What is it about this miracle that is so special, so important, that is so foundational for us to understand that we might then see throughout all of scripture hereafter as we journey with Jesus and we're gonna jump in. The first miracle that Jesus performed is at this wedding and in it, he reveals his intentions for humanity and the purpose for his coming then and his return in the future to reveal the kingdom and prepare the bride for her groom. In fact, in John chapter two, what, what you will notice is that this miracle, this first miracle is actually a preview of the wedding supper of the lamb that we all hopefully look forward to. It is a preview of what is to come. And in John chapter 20, even the writer of the gospel of John makes it clear to us later at the end of his book, why all of this is important that we know. And I wanna read it to you, John chapter 20 and verse 30, it says this, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. In other words, he did, he did a lot. And I don't, I don't possibly have the time nor the space to write every single thing that he has done, every single thing that he has said, but by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it is imperative that you know that Jesus' earthly ministry begins here, that this is his first miracle. But these, he continues, I have written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may know, you may have life in his name. So this story, this, this moment in time actually happened and we are to pay attention to it, we're to know it because it is supposed to reveal to us that Jesus is in fact the son of God who has come, the one we've been waiting for. But not only that, but it is to reveal to us that all of life is actually found in him and him alone. Now, as we journey through the gospels, we. We'll, we'll see many different miracles that Jesus performs, many, many different signs and wonders that he does. And, and though amazing, it's important that we understand that, that oftentimes we have a tendency to read the gospels and to act like the miracles of Jesus are like party tricks that he does, or like they're gimmicks that he does, or maybe Jesus like doesn't do well in like awkward social settings. So he just like has some skills. He's like, look what I could do. And then like, it just like loosens it up, you know, and now he can like lead that, like that's not what these are. These are in fact, monumental revelations of the character and the nature of God, if we would so dig into them. They, they, they show us the character and the nature of God and what we can expect in him. There's the rich with revelation. And in John chapter two, it reads this, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. One of the first things that seemingly here in John chapter two, we are to understand about the character of God in the person of Jesus is this, is that Jesus always shows up where he is invited. Jesus always shows up where he is invited. In fact, wise is the couple who invites Jesus to their wedding. I'll say it this way, wise is the business owner that invites Jesus to lead their business. Wise is the man or the woman who invites Jesus to lead their finances. Wise is the young couple who invites Jesus into their dating relationship so that it can go his way. 
wise is the mother and the father who invites Jesus into their parenting techniques to lead what is going on. We see that Jesus always shows up where he is invited and, and it reveals to us something specific about God's nature is that yes, he is most definitely always present. In fact, the psalmist will indicate and reveal to us that if I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I ascend to the highest heights, you are there also. Where can I go to escape your presence? Nowhere. However, what we see here is that there is also something specific about the manifest presence of God showing up in a moment when you invite him to so do in your life. That there are times and moments that God is absolutely present, but again, he is a gentleman. He's not gonna force his way into something that you don't give him space in. He is, he is waiting for an invitation oftentimes to step in in a even more special and unique way for you. This means that when you go to work this next week and that, that, that meeting is coming up, that God actually wants to be invited into that meeting. So much so that you would actually be more confident in his presence than you are in your presentation at that moment. That he would actually become the thing, the one you are most confident and sure of. Jesus always shows up where he is invited. And one of the things that I tell a lot of young adults um, as they're getting married, we, we've got a lot of weddings that are popping off right now here at Pillar. So I'm just telling you, if you're single, now's the time, okay? <laughs> it just seems like that's happening. Um, and uh, so like, that's where the oil is right now, as Preston would say. So just jump in, okay? Just be a part of it. Um, but, but as they're getting married, one of the things that like, they're, they're, they're navigating, like, who do I invite to a wedding, right? And hear me, like, you don't invite people to your wedding that you like, don't like. Okay, now you may have been forced to invite somebody to your wedding that you don't like, but like you really don't, you know what I mean? Especially, and what I, what I help young adults understand is I'm like, hey, let, let's just take emotions out of it. You understand you're paying $300 for that person to be there, right? <laughs> you're paying them to show up at your day. Does, do they, do you want them there that bad? And all of a sudden the decisions become easier, you know? <laughs> um, but you invite people that you want at your wedding. And we see that you'll see out throughout all much of the gospels that there are many times Jesus is just like walking and the Bible will indicate that he saw a man and so it drew his attention and he went to meet with him. Not the case here in John chapter two. Jesus is and was an invited guest to this wedding. Jesus was invited. That, that they specifically saw it fit that he be there on this special day and it shows us something and I wonder in our life how often we prioritize the invitation of Jesus into our situation over anything over anything else you know at pillar we talk a lot about the six pillars of your life and that you are to grow in all of them and that there is a a divine pathway that God has set out for you to grow in your finances and emotionally and relationally and professionally and all of these other ways but hear me, if you get everything right, but you don't get your spiritual life with Jesus right, it's all out of order. It's all out of whack. I, I know that, that my wisdom pales in comparison to most in this room, that, that I have not even lived half of the life that some of you in this room have lived, but I feel sure enough to say that if you don't get this thing with Jesus right, it doesn't matter how well you do in your finances, how well you do in your emotional life, how well you do relationally, for he is in fact everything. In fact, I'll say, I'll say it this way. The most important aspect of your life at all is spiritual. And I'll prove it to you. In Matthew chapter six and verse 33, it says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness above all else. And all of these other things will be added unto you. But it must not escape us in John chapter two that Jesus just shows up to a ordinary wedding. It's, it's not too far off for us as, as especially just followers of Jesus to understand that when we go through trauma and tragedy that Jesus wants to show up, that the Spirit of God wants to show up and carry you through. I, I don't think that's too difficult for us sometimes to understand. But, but you, know what, you know what oftentimes kind of escapes us is that we oftentimes have an idea or have this thought that like God doesn't want to celebrate like the most random, mundane, everyday, ordinary things in our life, and that is not the case. 
we see that God is actually full of joy and excitement to celebrate even those little moments with you. The, you got the job promotion. You paid off that debt. You, she said yes, you know? Like all of those things that like God wants to celebrate and be involved in even those things. We see that there is nothing beneath our God getting involved in. There is nothing too small that God doesn't want to be invited into in your life to journey th through it with you, to celebrate with you, or to, to mourn and to sit with you. I'm reminded, um, as I read John chapter two, I'm reminded of the way that I grew up. And I've, I've shared part of this story with you in the past, for those of you who have been here for any amount of time. Um, I grew up, uh, I'm a fourth, fourth generation pastor in my family. I, I grew up like in church, at church. Um, I'm pretty sure if I get this right, and I'm pretty sure my parents are probably watching, but I think I was born on like a Friday and like I was in church on the front row on Sunday morning. Like that was my life. I'm not, I'm not kidding. Actually, I might be exaggerating the time, but probably Saturday morning. But but I was in church like that next, that next day. And so I, I just grew up just knowing like, this is just what I've always done. And, and when I was a kid, it's funny now to look back on, but we, would, we were like so Christian, we would like drive to the restaurant and my parents would be the ones that pray that like, God, would you give us favor above all others, that we would get the parking spot right in front of the building, you know? And, and at the time we, we didn't live like in the snow. So like, there's no reason that like walking 30 extra feet should have been such a concern to us, you know? But there was, oh, we, we pray that we'd get the corner booth in the restaurant, you know, that's like reserved for all the significant people that maybe have reservations and, and, and we'd get it and then we'd sit down and we'd get the parking spot and, and my parents would say, guys, we're gonna pray. God, thank you so much for the favor that's on our life. Thank you so much for blessing us with this. Now, hear me, did God have anything to do with us getting that parking spot or that booth? I don't know. And to be honest, I don't really care. The reality is, I grew up believing that even the like dumb, trivial things of life, God actually wants to be involved in. And I wonder how much better, more hopeful, more joyful you might be able to walk through the, the journey of your life if you begin to realize God actually does want to be invited into even the like boring moments of your life that even you don't want to be a part of. God wants to be invited, and when he is invited, he always shows up. Continuing on in verse three, it says, and when they had run out of wine, mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And so Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour's not yet come. But his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Revealing to us probably one of the most fundamental things that you need to know about the person of Jesus and the character of God is that Jesus can be trusted. Jesus can be trusted, he ought to be trusted, and he must be trusted. In fact, wisdom says, do what he says. Mother of Jesus is, so you, you gotta remember, Jesus has not done a single sign up until this point yet. In fact, John, 11 will uh, John chapter two and verse 11 will tell us that after this, many who were there and many of the disciples that were like trying to figure out who he was come to believe that he is the one they've been waiting for because of this sign. But up to this point, he has not. But Mary's lived with him. Mary's been around. Not only that, but Mary holds on to the revelation that the angel of the Lord gave her. This is him. You're gonna carry him and he will save the world. So in a moment, Mary is drawing on who, he, who she knows Jesus to be saying, I know that you don't know him yet. I know that you haven't even seen him yet. I know that he hasn't done anything that you like assume or have been told he's gonna do yet, but just you wait. For he is in fact the one that you've been waiting for. He is, in, he is in fact the one that we have been longing for. He can be trusted. So whatever he tells you to do, you better do it. Interestingly, what you'll find if you study scripture is that these are the last words of Mary. We don't actually see any other words of hers recorded in scripture. And can you imagine what a life well lived that has to be. That in John 2, when you say, whatever he says to you, do it. 
that there are no better words to describe your life. There are no better words that anybody else needs to know you said, that it ends there. She summed up all of her life, all that needed to be in one statement, whatever he says to you, do it. You know, there's this game that we play in, in relationships and connections sometimes, or maybe at like you're at like a gathering or, or a group and, and you kind of are kicking it off. And you're like, well, what's your last meal? You know, like if you had a last meal, which is kind of like a morbid thought, but you know, hang with me for a second. Um, and if, if like you don't live within five minutes or five miles of an in and out burger, most people say in and out, okay? But then like, then they like live around in and out. You're like, it's cool. Like, it's good, but like, I don't know that I picked that for my last meal, right? But if you are a mature believer in Christ, you know the answer is Chick-fil-A, okay? So <laughs> you say Chick-fil-A and then you just move on to the next question, right? So, um, but we talk about last meal, but, but have you ever considered if you got to pick what your last words would be, what would they be? I wonder how the world around us might look different if we determined what our last words would be today. Whatever he says to you, make sure you do it. Oh, I, I wonder if, if that became the statement that everybody filtered my life through, that your neighbors filtered your life through, that your kids filtered your life through, that whatever God told them to do, they did it. Now, are you gonna get everything right? Absolutely not. But at least the testimony that it will show, the, test, the way that that will communicate to the next generation that there is only one thing I'm concerned about. If he says it, I do it. And that's where it stops. What a life to live. I need you to know today, it still works to trust Jesus. In a world that is trying to find a new way to do the old thing, it has worked, it does work, and it forever will work to do things God's way. It still works to trust Jesus. It still works to do relationships his way. It still works to parent your kids his way still works to forgive his way, still works to date his way, still works to love his way, still works to be patient his way. It still works to trust Jesus and to do what he says, for he in fact is the one who is holding all things together. He fashioned your and my life and he knows best. In fact, Jesus, says this, everyone who hears my words and puts them into practice is like a wise builder. And he goes on to tell this story of these two, of these two builders, one wise, one foolish, who both wanted to build a good house. And they had completed construction on the respective projects. And, and when they had both been done, both looked strong from the outside. And that is kind of how the advice of the world tends to look. Everything looks good. With enough lipstick, you can make a pig look pretty decent. Okay, like, like you can, with enough time, like you can convince somebody of something. There's a lot of things that look good. There's a lot of things that look like they'll suffice. A lot of things that look like they're good. And both houses looked very good, looked very sturdy. But as soon as a furious storm came up, the wind and the waves and the rain beat upon both houses. And when the storm passed and the clouds went away, there was only one house that remained and it was the one that was built on the rock, Christ Jesus in his word. It still works, friend. It in fact is the only thing that works. And Jesus says to the servants and the disciples there, he says, go get these, these water pots. And so they bring these water pots that are empty. They bring them to Jesus and, and Jesus transforms the water into wine. Doesn't add anything to it, but transforms the water into wine. And we see that, we see this revelation that I hope you understand and get today, write this down, that God can do anything with someone who is willing to give him everything. God can do anything with someone who is simply willing to give him everything. It, 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 it cannot escape you and I that what took Jesus moments should have taken years. 
And I wonder today how many things in our life, how many moments in our life, we don't give over to God, we don't give up and give it up to God, because we're trying to, I'm, I'm gonna figure it out, I'm gonna make it, that, that struggle that we've had, that habit that we can't break, uh, that vice that we seem to go back to, that way of relating, or, or that anger, or that impatience, all of these things that we try to just muscle it, up, muscle it out. Like we just try to like, oh, I'm gonna just do better and figure it out. And I wonder what would happen if you just for a moment decided I'm gonna give up and give it up and just see what God might be able to do in a moment. Though it's taken me years to get to this point and I still don't have the freedom that I'm looking for. I still don't have the hope that I'm looking for. He can do in a moment what would take and should take many, many years. But the sad reality is this, until you're willing to give him everything, you'll continually struggle with what's now and what's next. But when you give him everything, what's now will get lighter and what's next won't matter because obedience becomes your desire. In fact, John 14 says, if you love me, obey my commands. Not because I'm trying to control you, but because I made you and I made the life that you're in and I actually have the blueprint for your life. Like I, like I know what's around the corner and I'm trying to lead you the best way that I can. So just like follow what I'm saying. If you love me, obey my commands. In fact, one scholar said it like this, obedience to Christ will always be our greatest duty as a follower of Christ. Now there were set there six water pots of stone in verse six according to the manner of the purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. We see here that um, Jesus didn't touch the water pots. Jesus didn't add anything to the water pots. Jesus didn't have like a wine bottle in his pocket and be like, hey, here we go. Like I brought my own, you know? Um, it was not that kind of a kind of a party. In fact, uh, Jewish weddings, you have to understand, generally were not one day long. They oftentimes took a week, maybe even two weeks. Now, they're only like a couple days into this wedding and I've already run out. That is a massive like undershooting of how much it's gonna take to care for all these people that are, you either undershot how many people were gonna show up or like how much wine you would need. But either way, you were wrong, right? And Jesus shows up. And it's important that you know, like these are the intricacies about your Bible you gotta understand, you gotta sit with and just allow God to, to speak to you. Jesus doesn't touch the water pots. And though Jesus could have just completely done this all by himself, he could have just told the disciples and the servants, you need wine? Okay, just go check the wine. It's full now. You know, like he could have just done that. But he did it. He said, hey, go fill these pots. Then I want you to go draw from them and bring it to the master. And in doing so, shows us a key thing you must understand about the character of God and the nature of God is this. Not only does, is Jesus always show up where he's invited, not only can he be trusted, but he invites you and I then to partner with him in transformation. He, he invites you and I to partner much of what God's gonna do in your life, in fact, most of what God's gonna do in your life, he actually wants to partner with you in making it happen. Though he could just snap his fingers and do it, he is a personal God and desires to walk with you and talk with you and journey with you and get down dirty with you in whatever it is that you're going. In fact, much of what God's gonna do in the life of your spouse and in your kids, parents, he's gonna use you to be a part of doing that. Now, make no mistake about it, you don't really have like that significant of a part to play, but you definitely have a part to play. He is the one that brings transformation, but he allows you and I and invites you and I to partner with him in it. Jesus shows us that he has power over the natural, but yet still longs to partner with man in the transformation. And I love that the disciples in the service, they didn't second guess him, they didn't hesitate. They just simply did what he asked in faith. They just simply responded to Mary's faith even. 
and said, if you're so sure about him, it might be worth me giving him a shot as well. In fact, I'll, I'll just pause it and say this the last, I'll pause now and just say some of you in this room, like you may not actually have a personal relationship with Jesus, but my prayer is that as you step into spaces like this, that the faith of the people around you would cause your heart to yearn to understand who that person is that they seem so in awe of. Because if that's him, I need that. And they in John chapter two are, are wooed even by the faith of Mary to say, hold on a second. I'll do what he asked me to do and they find. The water was turned into wine because the servants cooperated with Jesus and obeyed his commands. Let me show this to you somewhere else. Ephesians chapter three and verse 20. Many of you know this verse. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, watch this, according to the power that is at work within us. Oh, he could do it all by himself, but he does it in and through us oftentimes. Paul, writing to the Philippian church in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, watch this, to will and to act in order to fulfill whose purpose? His good purpose. So God has a purpose for what he's doing on this earth. And he works in and through you to will and to act so that it can actually be accomplished. How amazing is that? That God wants to invite you to partner with him. And as they partner with him, the water is transformed into wine. Jesus doesn't add anything to the wine. Let me uh, just add anything. It's completely transformed. And that is a picture of what God wants to do in your life and in mine. And what he wants to continue to do in your life, I might add. He doesn't want to add something to your life. His desire is not to like better your life. His desire is to completely and utterly transform that which you think is your life. And for you to come into a realization that my life is not my own, to you I belong. God, I want, I want you, I actually I want my life to be hidden in you. And as they do, we see this. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants knew who had, uh, who had drawn the water knew. Master of the feast called to the bridegroom and he said, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. But, but you, but you're different. You, but you don't, you don't do things like everybody else. You don't act like everybody else. You don't respond like everybody else. It seems as though your ways are higher than my ways. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. You you seem to operate under a different standard. You seem to operate by different plans. You, you have kept the good wine until now. And it reveals to us this final truth for us to know today is that Jesus is good and he only does good. Psalm 119 and verse 68 says, you are good. And I've come to believe and know that you do only good. So teach me your decrees. If you journey with Jesus for any amount of time, you're going to find that Jesus will always do more than what you asked. Now, the more may not be what you asked specifically, but it'll always be better. Everything you ask, everything that you desire, everything that you hope for. God will always do exceedingly abundantly above that. For his ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts, as Isaiah 55 tells us. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Now to him who is able, Ephesians 3, to do exceedingly abundantly above all you ask or think. He can't. What's, what's shocking to me is this, as we close. Um, in, John, in John chapter 2, this, this miracle happens. But in John chapter 2 and verse 3, the Bible tells us that when they had run out of wine. So the whole, the whole like foundation for this miracle is when 
they ran out of wine. Jesus stepped in, they invited him, they asked, Jesus got involved, and then Jesus brought better wine than they had even prepared to begin with. They had planned this day, they had thought about this day, they had orchestrated all the details of this day only to realize that when Jesus shows up, he brought something better than the best that they thought they had to offer. And the same is true in your life and in mine. No matter what you think you've got, no matter what you think you can produce, no matter where you think, if I get here, hear me, Jesus' plans are always better and he always does more. But the reality is this, is that whatever is not from God will ultimately either run out or run you down at some point. It is not a matter of, it's not a matter of if, but rather when it runs out. When your energy runs out. When your hope in other things runs out. When all of the provisions you think you've made for your life run out. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. But we see that Jesus is always present. What's interesting to me is that in John chapter 2, um, the water pots are empty. And again, this, this, this feast is supposed to go on for, for a significant amount of time. This is supposed to take many more days. But yet, the water pots are empty, and the party is dragging. The party is waning, and yet Jesus is still there. Jesus is still present. For those of you, as we, as we land the plane here, for those of you that are in, your, in the room and you, you find yourself maybe filling your life with other things or maybe you even realize over the course of the time that you have filled your life with, with some other things, you need to know today that no matter how, how empty you feel, God is not that far away from you. Maybe you find yourself here today and you've invited Jesus into your life, but have then since lived your life on your own thinking it's yours to figure out and to lead and to orchestrate. Understand we serve a personal God who does not run away from you even though we don't give him the time of day at some time. He is still there. His eyes are still on you and he is still present waiting for him, waiting to be invited into these special and unique moments of your life. I wonder what God may have for you to respond to today. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Jesus simply performed this miracle at this wedding because a young couple found themselves in a difficult situation and required his help. They asked him, they brought what was empty and they allowed him to fill them. And when he did, he filled them in an even greater way than they were seemingly full before. It tells us that no matter what's going on in our life, that we ought to keep asking him, keep seeking him. Scripture says in Matthew 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. He is a personal God and he is with you. He is there. But I wonder today with your head bowed and your eyes closed what the Holy Spirit might be speaking to you through this message. For some of you today, I fully believe that today is your day. Again, I said at the beginning, we have a, a lot of times we think we know why God brought us into the house of the Lord today. But the reality is if you're here, it's because God ultimately desired for you to be here. For some of you today, you maybe don't even believe in Jesus, but today is your day to do as the wise couple in John 2 did and invite him, not just into a season of your life, but to be Lord of your whole life. Today's the day to accept him as the one that you've been longing for and realize that no matter what you try to build in your life, it will never compare to what God will do with you when you give up and give up your life to him it's pretty simple to do
The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And in a moment, our prayer team is gonna come up here and I would encourage that you, you make coming up here to pray with somebody your top priority today because there is no greater decision you will ever make in the history of your life than saying yes and inviting him to be Lord of your life. For others today, you know there's an area, there's something coming up. There's something you've been doing on your own and, and you know today that you're to invite him into that. Maybe it's a presentation at work. Maybe it's a difficulty with a child. Maybe it's a, a strain in your marriage and you know it's time that you invite God into that area. Today is the day for you to do so. For others, maybe today is the day you recognize that God's been wanting to partner with you for a very, very long time. And maybe even as we lead into Easter, your perspective would be heightened, your awareness would be heightened to know that God wants to use you and, and work through you. Maybe even over the next couple weeks to draw someone here that they might experience the goodness of God. Maybe he just wants to use you in the life of your spouse or your kids. But whatever the case, my prayer is that you would do as the mother of Jesus implores all of us, that you would hear the voice of God today and that your response would be, God, whatever you ask me to do, I will do it. God, I pray that you would speak to each and every heart today. Make it abundantly clear what it is that you want us to do. For God, our desire is to be led by you. Thank you that you love us. Spirit of God, speak to us now, but continue to speak to us this week as we go. We love you in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. I hope you were blessed by this message, and I truly hope you heard the Lord speaking to you through it. Before you go, make sure you hit the subscribe button and tap the bell icon so you're notified every time a new message is posted. And make sure to leave us a comment below sharing what God spoke to you and how he used this message in your life. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see you next time.